So first of all, I'll be handing over in a second to Sue Riddleson, who's the chief exec at uh, Bayer Regional. And in fact, Bayer Regional are our partners uh, with whom we jointly operate um, Oxfordshire Green Tech. Although today she'll have her uh, Bayer Regional hat on as she explains to us about how the UN SDGs can influence and create uh, impact. Uh, Sue, over to you, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, can you see my screen there? Yes, we can, thank you. Excellent. Um, so, um, as Martin says, we work extensively in Oxford and Cambridge and working with partners uh, to uh, create real life, um, sorry, it doesn't seem to be going on to the next slide. Oh, here we are. Uh, we work extensively in, in Oxford and, and Cambridge, um, where we're working with partners to create places and products which enable sustainable living, um, which for us means living well within the natural limits of our planet and leaving space for wildlife and wilderness. And that's what we call one planet living. But you could also say sustainable consumption and production, which is our topic for today. Um, and we use these great stories to, and examples to change policy and practice, which was how we came to end up working at the United Nations. So I'm going to tell you a bit today about the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it, they were agreed in September 2015 by 193 nations of the world. And they're the closest thing we've got to a plan for the better world we all want to see. Uh, they are, later that year, the Paris Agreement was also made. Um, and climate is included in the sustainable development goals. The goals are voluntary, unlike Paris, but um, governments have to report on progress to the UN. And so it started to be reflected in national and local government policy and procurement requirements and companies using them. I'm sure you may have come across them. Creating the goals <clears throat> was a three year process uh, with governments and civil society. So that they're, they're really strong, you know, they've got everything in there. Um, and Bioregional had a formal role as the NGO global focal point for sustainable consumption production. And we were part of the team who secured goal 12, which is the subject of our session today. Um, it's without doubt a business opportunity, um, as you can see here, you know, 12 trillion a year. Uh, and the, the time frame for the goals is 2030. Um, so hence, you see 2030 referenced. Um, and as you'll see from the case studies today, how that can look in practice. We are facing a climate and ecological emergency, but we can't swap out fossil fuels for biomass and our consumption of resources is leading to a devastating loss of biodiversity. And that's why it, the ecological footprint, which you can see here, um, shows both carbon, which you can see in, in the purple there, and resource use. And that's a good way to understand sustainable consumption and production. Uh, and what we like to explain, the way we like to explain it is if everyone in the world lived like we do in the UK or indeed Europe, uh, we'd need three planets to, to provide the resources we need to sustain our current lifestyles. And of course, global population is growing, so that isn't sustainable. So we do need to find a different way. Um, this slide just shows you how our three planet lifestyles made up. So our homes, building them, retrofitting them. You know, any work we do on the home, home energy use, transport, the food we eat is massive, all those consumer goods we buy, and then there's the sort of shared infrastructure. So there's a role for government um, and business in terms of the, sh the shared infrastructure to make it easy for all of us to live a sustainable lifestyle. Now, I'm not going to read this out, <laughs> but these are the targets of Goal 12. So in summary, there's a one planet network that you can join, which by regional are part of the buildings and construction group actually, and, and a, a few other of the one planet network groups. So there's a group you can join or just, you know, have a look at their website. And it uh, asks for all countries to take action with developed countries taking the lead. So this is a really a goal for us richer nations. Um, the goal is by 2030 to achieve sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources, halving food waste. And I think we're gonna talk about food waste today. <clears throat> sound management of chemicals and all wastes and not putting things out into the environment, reducing waste through prevention, recycling, circular economy. Companies adopt sustainable practice and integrate it into their reporting cycles, public procurement, and making sure people everywhere understand, you know, how to live a sustainable lifestyle. So this, these are the goals of Goal 12 or the targets of Goal 12. 
And government has responded to that by it's starting to make its way into policy. So a couple that I know about, and I'm sure there are more, um, is it's made its way into ICT procurement requirements. Uh, and it's popped up in the national planning policy framework this year. So um, it, it's, it's getting in there that the government's going to be asking for it. And I think if you mention it in any tenders, it's, it's a, a gold star and a tick. Um, local authorities are making plans. This is the Bristol plan, which goes into some detail about their targets uh, for how they're going to achieve the SDGs. So again, uh, look at for local authorities actually looking for requiring this in your, in your work. Large companies have taken on SDGs. So Tesco's focused on uh, food waste, and this is from their action plan. They're aiming to help halve global food waste and make all packaging recyclable. So you can see there how across our economy, this is having an impact. For bioregional, um, as, as you probably know, we, we use our One Planet Living framework, which maps completely against the SDGs. And indeed, when we were championing the SDGs, we were saying it could look a bit like this, <laughs> you know, with people-centered goals. And so that's the framework that we use to implement sustainable consumption and production based on those 10 principles from zero carbon, through to health and happiness and, and very holistic, just like the goals. Um, and so this is a tool that any of you can use and is being used in Oxfordshire and it's, it's used all around the world. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, B&Q, um, the home and garden improvement retailer have been using it for about 10 years, uh, a bit more than that now, and we've, we've worked with them on that. And it's led to um, innovations in products. So for example, um, you know, those terrible polystyrene uh, plant pack packaging. Um, they've stopped using that and now uh, using a little tiny, like a seed tray, uh, and they've replaced peat compost with peat free. Uh, so they've got reusable packaging and, um, oh, sorry, someone's just walked into the office and is being noisy, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and also they've um, reduced their packaging waste on their worktops, so they, found that if they use a read a take back packaging that sort of clips around the kitchen worktops uh, then that's makes the customer happy uh, but also has saved them a million pounds in um, their pack, packaging costs um, so we, there's two products there that show how um, adopting scp um, can uh, really lead to business um, savings and um, help it make customers happy. Just another minute, Sue, please. Yeah, this is my last slide. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, I got a bit distracted by that person coming. Um, so One Planet Oxfordshire is something where uh, the bioregional are, are sort of championing and leading on working with the city council and the county council and a number of the district councils. Uh, and you can see the link there for the annual review, which was published a few weeks ago. And it just shows, you know, the achievements have been made a lot around carbon, but we need to, and recycling rates are high, but we need to do more on the circular economy in Oxfordshire. So I think uh, there are some huge opportunities there uh, for, for all of us. Uh, so uh, that was my sort of high level introduction. And I, and I know that um, we're now going to go into a bit more detail with um, uh, Professor Actas. So thank you very much. So thank you very much indeed. That's a great start for us. It certainly sort of uh, gives a clear indication of SDG, well, the whole of the SDGs and SDG 12 in particular. Uh, but as you've just said, I'd like to uh, carry on. I'm just conscious of time. So I'd like to welcome Professor Emil Aktas, who's Professor of Supply Chain Analytics, uh, Logistics, Procurement and Supply Chain Management. Crikey, that's a long title, Professor. My mum said, said, if you can't get a good job, get one with a long title. And I don't mean that you've not got a good job, by the way. But anyway, over to you, conscious of time. Uh, Emil, please take the Thank talk. you. Thank you for your kind of, uh, invitation and introduction, Martin. Um, I'm a professor of supply chain analytics, and the rest is where I work. So I work in the logistics procurement and supply chain management research center. But I guess an act has been missing uh, wherever the specific information is coming from. So thank you so much for your uh, invitation to this event. And I just want to give an overview of challenges and opportunities for responsible uh, production and consumption. And uh, some of the information uh, I plan to share, Sue has kindly already uh, mentioned that we need uh, three plants worth of material if we uh, do not change the way we are living. And one of the reasons for that is the projected population growth, 8.5 billion 
by um, 2030 and 9.7 billion by 2050 in current projections. And uh, the reason we are talking about responsible consumption and production is that uh, we have come across recent events around the supply chain in various sectors, such as the fashion, uh, fashion sector with poor working conditions, unsafe working conditions, and structural disadvantages for women in food supply chains, for example. And uh, there is an interface between companies and consumers in communicating the sustainability of the uh, product, its production processes and uh, how it is consumed. But then uh, we have massive amount of uh, choices for the consumer and sometimes the information around the sustainable nature of the product is lost. So we are looking for ways for consumers to be more sustainable consumers and for companies, for producers, manufacturers to become uh, much more sustainable in their processes. So I'll briefly talk upon uh, the food, water, energy nexus at the broad scale and the impact on the um, Earth's um, resources and biodiversity and uh, also a little bit on the plastic wave uh, that we have uh, already heard uh, from Sue. And some opportunities are highlighted here um, for uh, going forward, changing our ways uh, of consuming and producing and hopefully addressing uh, the challenges we have uh, today. So if we look at the agriculture, including irrigation, livestock and aquaculture, it is by far the largest water consumer. It's accounting for almost 69% uh, of annual freshwater withdrawals. And uh, unfortunately, the nature is not capable of uh, purifying and restoring this uh, freshwater withdrawal. So we have to find uh, ways of reducing it and um, and also uh, helping nature to recover uh, through, the, uh, through more sustainable agricultural uh, processes. We've touched upon food waste. We will hear, we have been hearing this statistic about one third of the food uh, produced never ends up on the plate. It, it's lost in the post harvest, transportation, storage, distribution, and sometimes even in the fridge freezer of the consumer having been bought but never had a chance to uh, arrive on the plate. And the food sector itself accounts for around 30% of uh, total energy consumption and 22% of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So um, we have many challenges, but food sector appears to be the place that we can, uh, where we can make a, a great impact. And in terms of the energy, we have had uh, some uh, technological advances to reduce the uh, energy efficiency. But still, the OECD countries continue to uh, grow by about 35% in their energy withdrawal, and the commercial and residential uh, energy use is the second most rapidly growing area. So again, we have to find uh, sustainable ways of meeting this growing energy demand. Currently, the rate at which we withdraw the fresh water, extract materials from the earth, and consume energy is unfortunately unsustainable. So what is sustainable consumption and production? It has been uh, defined in 1994, uh, also Symposium on Sustainable Consumption, as the use of services and related products which respond to basic needs and bring a better quality of life while minimizing the, the use of natural resources and toxic materials. So there is a, a reference to the emissions from waste pollutants over the life cycle of a product and it's all about this uh, sustainable development uh, for our future generations. It mainly has decoupling environmental degradation from economic growth, uh, which means doing more and better with less, increasing net welfare gains from economic activities by reducing resource use, degradation and pollution and uh, delivering more in goods and services uh, in terms of the resource implications. Applying life cycle thinking is about increasing the sustainable management of resources, achieving resource efficiency, and considering uh, both intermediate inputs during distribution, marketing, use, waste, and disposal of the products. 
And sizing opportunities for developing countries is something to do with uh, bypassing the polluting technologies. Now we have a better way of producing energy, reducing the environmental impact of certain production processes. So the developing countries do not have to go through the same um, transition process as the developed countries has gone and they can bypass the polluting technologies and introduce um, greener technologies uh, right uh, up front. Now, you've talked about growing material uh, footprint and this is to do with the amount of uh, consumption we are uh, doing as well. We are buying products, we are using them, we are changing everything that we are uh, using. Just to give you a few statistics here, for example, the annual consumption will double to 8.2 trillion dollars in China and six trillion dollars in India by 2030. Just uh, as a reference, uh, today the consumption value is at 16 trillion dollars in the United States and uh, the statistics also show that the consumers are consuming less responsibly compared to what they have been doing five years ago. Now, consumer behavior changes uh, within a country, within geographies, but what really uh, matters is that us creating the demand for the products and services that are moving along the supply chain, demanding that all the operations are performed in a sustainable way, the material uh, footprint is lower, the carbon, the water energy footprint is lower for the products and services that we are uh, demanding. Um, we've talked a little bit about the biodiversity loss. Uh, over 1 million animal and plant species today are threatened by extinction and uh, many of uh, our world's ecosystems are at risk of collapse. So to stop and reverse the biodiversity loss, we need sustainable increases in crop yields. We need um, humans to consume maybe less uh, animal calories in their diets and uh, reducing the waste from uh, the food supply chain uh, significantly. Whilst we are increasing restoration, conservation and uh, balancing production and conservation objectives uh, in a better way. And uh, the final challenge for uh, today that I would like to highlight is the plastic wave. Um, we know it, it's um, everywhere in all products that we use, touch, because it's versatile, cheap and convenient. Uh, but that convenience costs us uh, a significant uh, harm in marine life and uh, damaging uh, habitats. About 11 million metric tons reach oceans and it's impossible for nature to uh, reverse that uh, increase in plastic. We have arrived at this point mainly because we didn't really think about what will happen to the products that are made of plastic at the end of life and we didn't have enough measures to uh, regulate the disposal. The source of this uh, slide breaking the plastic wave uh, also reports that it is possible um, to cut annual flows of plastic into the ocean by about 80%. That's quite a high percentage. Um, in the next two decades by applying existing solutions and technologies. And um, thinking about new technologies and new solutions, there may be a, a great opportunity to say is there. And let's talk a little bit about, okay, these are some major challenges. Uh, what opportunities do we have? One of them, uh, you might have come across uh, the concept of circular economy, moving from the take, make, waste, linear economy into a circular one where we are keeping the products longer uh, in, the, in use and we are designing the products to reduce uh, the waste and pollution and regenerating uh, natural systems. So the waste and pollution are consequences of decisions that we make in the design phase and uh, it is indeed possible to design for circularity, design for what material inputs uh, will be in the product, design for uh, disassembly, for example, to retrieve usable parts once the product reaches its end of life. Another trend that we need to reverse is this um, fast fashion. Um, we have moved away from high quality, long lasting products into uh, this short innovation cycles. A new update comes, a new upgrade comes to the product. We are looking for changing um, every year or maybe more frequently than that. And that 
re uh, creates a lot of um, waste and uh, inefficient use of our resources. So this trend, if it can be reversed, uh, will have one of the greatest impacts in reaching um, the responsible consumption and production goal. And in terms of the natural processes, if we uh, look at the nature, everything is food for something else. But when we design uh, uh, the products and production processes and services for humans, we don't really think about what's going to happen once this thing is consumed. Can its waste become input to another process? And um, as an answer to that uh, question, I'm going to show just uh, a few examples, uh, not by no means uh, comprehensive. Um, one of them is uh, this uh, Guru Cycle product uh, where the innovative social enterprise has pioneered growing oyster mushrooms from waste coffee grounds. You might have heard of them. Uh, Coffee grounds, which otherwise would be wasted, are already uh, sterilized during the um, coffee making process and they make a, a perfect uh, bed for mushrooms. And another one thread up is an online consignment thrift store where the clothes that we are no longer interested in wearing, but not necessarily at the end of their life, can find a second uh, user. And uh, the toast ale here, which is a craft beer brewed from surplus fresh bread uh, that would otherwise be wasted, both reducing um, the uh, need for virgin barley in the process and also using um, uh, the way food waste, the bread waste uh, that is uh, otherwise going to end up in the bin. So we are in need of uh, more of the, those type of new business models. And once the new business models are there, what we can also contribute to responsible consumption and production is having smarter shipping and distribution. Knowing where the products are, having a better sense of the demand, we can uh, reduce the mismatches between supply and demand, which is one of the reasons, especially for products like food items, which are perishable to go to waste. Other things are around uh, supply, adaptive supply, again, capturing uh, the market and being aware of the production capacities as well to better allocate uh, resources. Into, Another minute, uh, uh, please, Amo. Meeting uh, the demand. So uh, to summarize, uh, we need consumers to buy better and we need consumers us to consume better using uh, less resources, less products and uh, throwing away better. Thinking about what's going to happen to that electronics item that I am no longer interested in using, but it can still function in some way. And what we need also uh, going to the future is policies to incentivize the transition into the uh, green economy. And one thing that is missing currently is this uh, standardization of reporting in sustainability metrics. When you buy a food item, you immediately see how much carb, protein, um, calories from sugar are inside. But imagine a world where you can also see the carbon footprint, water footprint, and energy footprint of the products uh, that you are buying. Then you can have a conscious decision on uh, which one to buy. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Emil, thank you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you both to uh, to Sue and to yourself, Emil, for setting the context of both the SDGs more generally, and then of course SDG twelve uh, in particular. So let's now go on to look at some of the actual uh, practical solutions which are being put forward by our various members and partners. And I'm going to hand over to Oriane initially. I think Oriane, you have a yeah. Um, a video for us from uh, the Cheeky Panda, our partner and associate founder member who are sponsoring this series of events. Right, I'll start now. Hi everyone, it's Chris Forbes from the Cheeky Panda. Just like to give you a little bit of background about our responsible uh, production and consumption. So we started the Cheeky Panda with the idea that using bamboo is the world's fastest growing plant as a more sustainable alternative to trees which take 30 times longer to grow. We, we didn't just do the analytics, we actually went to visit the site, we went to make sure that the, the farming was cooperative, that it's FSC certified, so that's independently audited, that our, our manufacturers were using carbon capture, where they're capturing the steam from the, the pulping plant, and then that's um, turned back into electricity and the water has been recycled. We also did a, a, a cradle to grave carbon footprint report, um, where we analysed, and, and because bamboo produces 
uh, more oxygen and absorbs more carbon in the growth rate that we're 65% less carbon um, than um, normal trees and not just being satisfied with that we then got in touch with the World Land Trust and uh, we work on our carbon balancing project by investing into the uh, Vietnamese rainforest and that makes us carbon neutral um, and in addition to that we also um, have paper packaging and where possible in all our products to make it you know responsible production and consumption. Right. That's it. <laughs> okay, Oriane, thank you very much. So that's uh, the cheeky panda with the um, environmental paper tissues that they produce from bamboo instead of uh, timber sources. And I don't think I've ever seen Chris without that panda hat on his head. I think it's glued on, but I think he's hoping to join us a little bit later on in the uh, in the breakout rooms. So thank you for that, uh, Oriane, and thank you to uh, to Chris for the sending the video in. Now let's move on. Uh, next we have um, Lottie, Lottie Hawkins, who's the founder of Earthly Biochar. So Lottie, over to you. Lottie, I think you might be on mute, Lottie. There we go. Okay, thank you. No worries. I'm just going to share my slides. Yeah, we can see those. Thank you. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm Lottie Hawkins. I'm one of the founders of Earthly Biochar, and I have Connor with me today, the other founder. OK, there we go. Um, so let's just get straight to it. I'm going to tell you how biochar is a form of carbon capture, um, and it's one of the recognised negative emission technologies by the IPCC, the Royal Society, and most recently the UK government. So um, biochar is a charcoal-like substance. You can make it from any waste organic biomass. We actually focus on making it from waste wood. But in this diagram here, you can see that um, trees that absorb carbon um, or any form of biomass, when we pyrolyze them, so that's heating them at a high temperature of around 600 degrees in a low oxygen environment, what we end up doing is we um, capture 50% of the carbon into this really kind of secure, um, stable structure. Um, and then also 50% of the carbon will be released in the process. And that comes out as heat energy and as steam and carbon dioxide. And most of that heat energy in most processes can be used to create energy or they can be used to actually heat um, district heating, uh, so kind of heating homes. So. The biochar structure is really, really stable when it's put into the soil, the carbon won't biodegrade and it can stay there for hundreds to thousands of years. So, um, as I said earlier, we make ours from waste wood. So in the UK, there's about five to 10 million tons of waste wood generated each year. Some of that goes to make energy, which is carbon neutral. Um, some of it's made into particle board, animal bedding. But the problem with this is in most processes, the carbon goes back up into the atmosphere. So we asked ourselves, what if there's a way to intercept the carbon before it has a chance to escape back into the atmosphere? And could we permanently fix that carbon um, and then use it to improve our soil health and create bigger and healthier plants? So there is a way, and like I said, that's biochar. And this is what it looks like under an electron scanning microscope. So the biochar is incredibly porous and all of these pores that you can see are negatively charged, which means it holds onto water and fertilizer. So it's really good to improve resource efficiency when applied to soils. We ran some grey tests with our local council with biochar and you can see in these images that the soils that had biochar with them, you only need a small amount, it's about 10%. Um, the plants that were grown in that soil, they had really healthy roots, much further developed, and also they had more above ground biomass. This actually led to me starting a PhD in biochar and I've been reading around the subject and found that there's been about 10 to 15 years of academic research into it and it has got proven benefits as a soil amendment. Here's some more great tests. Um, I just thought I'd tell you really quickly that the average yield increase of biochar is about 12% and people can use it to cut their water and fertilizer by about 20 to 40%. So the next step for our company is to go from making biochar on a small scale. We developed a small biochar kiln to actually setting up a big facility. And we're working with um, companies like Pyreg who have developed amazing biochar um, pieces of equipment and we're applying for government funding to do this. I'm now going to hand over to Connor, who's going to tell you a bit about the applications of biochar. Thank you, Lottie. So, yeah, as, as we said, um, biochar has quite a unique position that it's a climate change mitigation tool. So it can help mitigate the worst of climate change, but it can also help us adapt to the inevitable uh, in 
making our soils more drought resilient. So now I'm just gonna quickly talk about concrete. Uh, so there's a really interesting document called 55 uses of biochar. It's not just for soil. And you can actually mix biochar into concrete at 1% by weight. And what this does is it enhances the mechanical strength of the concrete. It also reduces the water permeability. And there were 4 billion tons of concrete produced in 2019. And this would be 40 million tons of biochar, which is equivalent to 100 million tons of CO2 sequestered yearly. And this is just the market for concrete. Uh, it also can be used as a bitumen replacement in asphalt. So this actually reduces asphalt's temperature susceptibility, which also significantly increases the rutting resistance of asphalt. So yet again, it can have a carbon benefit as well as a performance benefit. And surprisingly, biochar can also be made into an industrial diamond. And this works by running biochar through a plasma reactor. And this enables us to sell these diamonds at $100,000 per tonne into applications such as drill bits or tunnel boring machines. And lastly, one of the future exciting applications of biochar is in electronics and graphene. So funnily enough, it's the same production technology as we would make diamonds. So um, this also shows the many potential uses of biochar and it's also being investigated as a potential for hydrogen storage. Because uh, one of the issues with storing hydrogen is that it can find its way out of many different materials. And as, as you saw the, the porous structure of biochar, the hydrogen sort of gets lost in there and it can sort of capture it and make sure that it can't escape. So it's very exciting biochar, as you can probably tell. It's quite difficult to know which one to start with, but at the moment we're focusing on soil. And actually yesterday we were at RHS Hampton Court Flower Show demonstrating biochar to the public and showing off our back garden biochar kiln. Um, yeah, but that's us. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please do reach out to us. We're on social media as Earthly Biochar. And also, I believe Oriane's going to share our LinkedIn so you can contact us on that. And thank you very much. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you both very much uh, for that. Um, Terrific uh, presentation. I think we have some biochar specialists uh, with us today in the audience. So if you go into the breakout rooms at the end, we can have some uh, discussion um, around that. Right, let's keep uh, let's keep moving on. Uh, next, we have Rupert, it's Rupert Hill, who's the marketing manager at Winnow. He's going to talk to us about uh, food waste recycling. Uh, Rupert. Thank you, Martin. Um... I've just had a notification that my network bandwidth is low, so I don't know how how good my signal is going to be, but let me know if it if it's not good enough. Um, yeah, but anyway, thanks uh, thanks for having me. Um, like I said, I'm Rupert. I'm um, the marketing manager at Winnow, and we help to cut food waste throughout the hospitality industry. And we've heard a little bit about. Um, food waste today. I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, where Winnow is based, uh, how the technology works, and kind of some of the insights that you get from, um, from our AI technology. So we've only got five minutes, so I'll get stuck into it. Um, yeah, Winnow's a business has um, been around for, um, since 2015, and we now fight food waste um, around the world, really trying to tackle this global problem. We're present now in 48 countries. Um, and we reduce, um, we, re uh, we save our clients $42 million a year. And you can see some of the brands that, that trust us down at the bottom. Um, and we're really looking to, to scale this impact. This is really just a, a drop in the ocean. Uh, and we look to considerably scale this in the coming years. Um, in terms of um, the financial um, downsides um, to the hospitality industry, Obviously, it's a, an environmental challenge, but the, the financial aspect of it is, is very compelling. Um, so typically, data that we've pulled says that um, food waste um, in commercial kitchens is somewhere between 4 and 12% of food costs. In many kitchens, this can be as high as 20% or over. Um, so particularly in a low margin business like hospitality, reducing food waste is a very cost savvy thing to do. Um, looking at this from a, a kind of post pandemic lens, we've actually seen that kitchens that have gone back um, into operation 
after the pandemic, I found that food waste has gone up um, further still. There's more challenging operating environments, um, demand is fluctuating, and um, there's often a lot of new staff that are tackling this. So we really believe that in this post-pandemic environment, um, with a lot of businesses really struggling just to make it through right now, um, reducing food waste is, is one of the most sensible things that you can do in, a, in your food operation. A bit on the, the technology and the AI we've developed itself. Um, so we have a scale that sit, um, a tablet um, and a camera rather that sits above the bin. Every time something's thrown away, like these green peas, a photo is taken, and then the AI model can determine what exactly that food is. Um, you can see here another example with the cucumbers. The, the model draws an outline um, of the freshly discarded food. Um, the scale beneath the bin weighs the item. And from this um, data, this is all then aggregated, sent to the cloud, and then fed back to the kitchen team um, for them to use um, the following day. It's really, I mean, the technology is a, um, a kind of um, a cool eye-catching thing of what we do, but it's really the analytics and the data that is fed back to the kitchen teams, which is really the most important things. Um, you can quickly pinpoint waste areas to reduce overproduction. If you're not used to um, cooking at scale, you know, this may seem like this is not a, a, you know, a particularly important thing to do, but when you're making hundreds or sometimes thousands of, of portions each day, being able to say, okay, on Tuesday lunchtime, we had a, a particular spike in this ingredient. When you can start to compile those analytics on, on a single site basis or over hundreds of different sites, um, the savings are, are quite significant. Lastly, um, the, the pictures um, that we provide are actually um, one of the most powerful insights that we offer to clients. And I've pulled these together just to give you a bit of an indication on, on, on why these images are important and to show you a bit of a comparison. Now, these aren't the most Instagram worthy photos, um, but they do tell a bit of a story. So if you look on the left hand side here, you can see that the peppers that have been thrown away, there's still quite a lot of pepper um, left around this core. And similarly with the, the salmon, a high value ingredient, um, perhaps there's some there's some production um, parts of production there that can be optimized. In the middle section, the average um, is still, I think it's better than the, the poor, but there's still some um, pepper, predict, particularly at the bottom here that you can identify. And again, with the salmon, um, to see any of the kind of uh, flesh of the fish suggests that there's a, a, um, a food waste reduction opportunity there. And then finally, on the right hand side, you can just see the kind of non edible food parts here. Uh, and the skin of the fish. That, so that is really a good example um, of, of um, yeah, food, food production practices. Finally, um, yeah, typically we, we reduce food waste in, in kitchens by over 50%. Um, and this delivers um, a return on investment from between two to 10 times in the first year. Um, and the reduction is, initially um quite quite um quite drastic it then in the middle middle period you can identify some some further efficiency gains before maintaining a kind of long-term um a long-term stable level um to ensure that you, you're set up for success in the long term we found that if you then remove the system from the kitchen um, after this period food waste returns back to um, the same levels that you can see before you put the, the solution in. There's really something that's needed on an ongoing basis um, into kitchens. Thanks very much. Rupert, that's uh, terrific. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, really uh, fascinating insight into what can happen or is happening in some of the restaurants and kitchens uh, that, you, uh, that you operate with. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, conscious of time, so let's keep going. And next up we have Peter uh, Windischoffer, who's the founder of Refurbed. So we're now moving into refurbished electronics. Uh, Peter, over to you. Thanks, everybody. And, uh, you know, uh, great to, to, to be here and uh, present Refurbed to all of you. 
Um, probably also thanks for the other uh, presentation. It's been very, very interesting so far. Let me just share my screen here. Um, I'm going to talk today about refurbished product. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about it is obviously because we need to change the way we consume, right? We know climate change is coming, we know it's a massive problem. And for us, the most obvious step to tackle, you know, at least parts of it is by reusing the stuff we already have. And refurbished products, you know, obviously do that because they give, uh, in our case, electronics, a second life. And what, how we define refurbished products is that these products are uh, complete, are used, phones, laptops, and tablets. They're completely reused. They look like new and uh, they function like new. And this customer who is save around 40%, get at least 20 of warranty and the products are super sustainable. And the combination of sustainability and low price is something that is, is actually very unique. And if you think about it, a lot of the products out there on the consumer side actually are more expensive if they are sustainable, like electronic cars, fair clothing, vegan milk. Um, and so we have these products that are actually cheaper and more sustainable. And that's something that is very interesting for a lot of people because most people out there and we did a survey that with the result that 80% of all Germans actually want to do something good for the environment. However, they don't want to spend money on it. And so with the first products they actually save money and do something good for the environment. And this is why we, we love the products so much. And so what we did there, um, here again, so to go through the, the different the value proposition for the, the customers and the merchants but actually I actually want to want to focus on on the slides the right hand set sustainability part because with with products we're actually saving 70 percent of co2 compared to a new product we're also obviously saving this the electronic waste because we are using a product not only once but even twice or three times and in Europe electronic waste is a massive problem globally we're at around 50 million tons of electronic waste produced every year and it's the fastest waste category, fastest growing waste category on the planet right now and in Europe we actually have the highest rate of e-waste with around 16 kilograms per capita per year and that's something that we want to change obviously on top of that we also plant the tree for every product that we sell in order to have even more positive impact on the environment and what we did is we built a marketplace for that so it means we have professional merchants uh, they are refurbishing the products and then they are actually selling their products through our platform to consumers. So it means we ourselves actually don't refurbish the products. We're also not touching the product. We don't have a warehouse, we don't have operations, but we have these professional merchants that are really good companies um, that are really strong in refurbishing the products. And we're creating a platform for them so that they can actually sell the products to consumers. And so what we do is we, for one, create this platform. We also handpick those merchants that make sure that only a very high quality merchants are on board. And then we're building the brand, we're actually building this movement around refurbished electronics for the consumer. And so we're trying to get as many products to consumers as fast as possible. And so this was the start of our business model. And just a few weeks ago, we actually started closing the loop, right? So far we only sold products. Now we actually enabled customers to sell back their old electronics to the merchants. So we actually closed the loop, which means we're now having really a circle economy business model where all the trunks come in, they get refurbished and they get sold again through our platform. And that's something we, we feel really, really strong about. And we really like that we have a circularity in the core of our business model. In terms of impact, what we've managed to achieve over the last uh, four years is I think very, very strong. Uh, we already saved more than 20,000 tons of CO2. Uh, we already reduced around 100 tons, 100 tons of um, electronic waste, and at the same time planted more than 500,000 trees uh, over the last few years. If we look at the market and the, also the opportunity, the refurbished products market is already huge. And if we look in, in, in Europe for consumer electronics, we're talking at the market around 50 billion. So it's a really, really big market. And at the same time, it grows very quickly. France is actually the market with the highest maturity and the highest usage of refurbished products. Around 45% of all phones in France are already secondhand. In other markets like Germany and Austria, which are our core markets, we only had around 10% of all phones being uh, refurbished. At the same time, around 70% of Germans actually say that they're willing to buy refurbished products. 
So we see that the market there is growing massively and we see a very strong demand from the consumer. And that's obviously great for us as a company, but more importantly, it's great for, for our society and our environment because we see that um, refurbished products are increasing in popularity. A few reasons why the market is increasing is on the one hand side, prices for new electronics are increasing quite a lot over time. Like in the last 10 years, the, the, the price for a new iPhone um, more than doubled. At the same time, people are using smartphones longer and the rate of innovation is just going down iPhone 12 and iPhone 11 is a very similar business, a very similar product. Um, and then obviously there is a strong push on the environmental side um, that we already talked about um, from a consumer side where you know, a lot of people want to risk, but also from a government point of view, there's a lot of stuff happening. Obviously you know that um, the, the Green Deal of the EU that also creates um, a right to repair that actually uh, makes custom, makes more manufacturers design the products in a way that they're actually easier to repair, which was very important for them to be able to refurbish. Um, and also in the US, and we see a lot of money going into this whole sector. Ultimately, what we're gonna build is actually the, the good Amazon for the circular economy. We not only wanna offer electronics, but also much more than that. We also wanna go in other categories, for example, like uh, fashion, like uh, toys, like furniture, like sports equipment, because we believe we want to be this one-stop shop for customers to buy cons uh, to buy sustainable products. And we want to build that. And we believe that right now is an amazing opportunity to actually build a company like that. And yeah, uh, obviously very happy to, to get in touch with all of you. Uh, I hope you're interested in, in, uh, in Refurb. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Peter, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. I, I think one or two questions are popping up now in the chat box. Sylvie will make a note of those and we'll cover those in the uh, panel discussion shortly. A um, couple more speakers to go. And uh, next we have Hannah Standen, who's the founder of Looped. And uh, well, we heard earlier from uh, Professor Act uh, Actas about the um, issues to do with uh, fashion. And so um, Hannah, you're gonna tell us about upcycling uh, fashion. Uh, over to you. Hi, cool. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Yeah, all good, great. Cool. So uh, yeah, I'm Hannah and I am one of the co-founders of Looped. So Looped is a sustainable marketplace for upcycled designers and our mission is to reduce textile waste. So before explaining about what Looped is and how we can contribute to responsible consumption development, I'm gonna share with you a couple of facts that inspired us to first create Looped. So the fashion industry is responsible for close to 10% of annual um, global carbon emissions, um, which is more than shipping and maritime and flights combined. The current value of the global apparel market is currently valued at 1.5 trillion US dollars, and this is expected to grow to about 2.5 to 5 trillion by 2025. And this means if we don't change something, the industry will also double its emissions. And this is because the fashion industry supply chain is extensive. From extraction and production of raw materials to the end of use of the final garment, the apparel industry alone cre creates roughly 3.3 billion tonnes of CO2 annually. And 50% of these emissions are generated within the first three stages of fabric production. So just a little bit more um, data on the impact. 20% of freshwater pollution in the world comes from the textile industry. More than 60% of fabric fibers derived from fossil fuels. And the equivalent of one garbage truck of textiles is either landfilled or is incinerated every second. So pretty shocking, right? Well, we thought so. So my two co-founders co and I come from a background in sustainability and fashion. We were part of a campaigning group in London, trying to raise awareness about the industry's unsustainable practices and trying to educate consumers and drive them to change their shopping habits. Our first-hand observations realized that there was a lack of tangible change within the industry, with the industry often using words rather than actions. Driven by our passion for the environment and our passion for fashion, we decided to do something about it. We decided to create a solution that used creativity to combat one of the biggest issues facing the fashion industry today. So we came up with Looped. And Looped is a marketplace for upcycled designers. 
However, we go further than simply being a marketplace. After all, our mission is to reduce textile waste. Currently, brands and manufacturers and charity stores have years of excess stock and materials that is either left in warehouses, discarded or shipped off to third world countries where they're damaging local textile industries. We'll be collecting this previously discarded and underutilized materials and providing them to the designers selling on loot, making it easier for them to access these materials and ultimately stopping them from reaching landfill. We want to show that just because these materials already exist in circulation, they are at no less value than what the factories are producing new. In some cases, they're more valuable. Our vision is to create a space which celebrates creativity and design while revolutionizing the way that the fashion industry views and consumes waste. In recent years, the sustainable market is grow has been growing at a rapid rate. However, still most of this market focuses on making new products rather than using existing materials. They're not working towards solving textile waste. Um, so this is why we chose to upcycle rather than upcycle. Upcycling is to creatively use discarded materials or objects in their current form to create a product of higher quality or value than its original components. Recycling or downcycling relies on the use of chemicals and mechanical procedures to break down fibers before they can be made into new fabrics and materials. This results in using additional natural resources to do so. Unlike recycling, upcycling does not require any further engineering processes. So the answer to the question is because upcycling is one of the most sustainable things you can currently do within the fashion industry today. Not only can you give a garment a second life, but you can reduce its CO2 impact by up to 79%. So Looped is a value-driven company and the five key pillars of Loop to guide every decision we make. We're deeply passionate about sustainability and as a purpose-driven co co company, we strive to make a positive impact on our planet, our community and our industry. So one of the key aspects, and this is how we really challenge consumption, is creating a community of like-minded individuals to fight the industry and challenge over consumption. Along with providing designers with a space to produce, we will be giving consumers an alternative solution where they can still engage with fashion, but through a more sustainable way. We'll be using our platform to engage, educate and inspire. We believe in the power of collective action and that we can use fashion and culture to inspire changes within consumer behavior. Because at Looped, as we see it, fashion is culture and culture has the power to drive change. We wanna harness the power of creativity and design and use it to change the way we produce and consume in the fashion industry today. Um, so we'll be launching later this year. So if you wanna follow our journey, you can follow us on social media or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any questions. Hannah, that's uh, terrific. Thank you very much indeed. We'll uh, be watching that uh, closely and look forward to your uh, launch uh, later in the year. I think you've certainly got a community of interest uh, here at this, uh, this event. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, last but uh, not least, uh, we're going to, well, I'm going to hand over to uh, Gerard, Gerard Fisher in a moment, who's a partner on circular business models at uh, QSA Partners. And at the same time, we're going to hand over the baton for the administration and the facilitation to um, Sylvie, who's going to take you through the, uh, the panel discussion. So, Gerard, over to you. Five minutes, please. Um, on Hi, QSA everyone. Partners. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. OK, so hi, I'm Gerard Fisher from QSA Partners. We're an associate founder of Oxfordshire Green Tech's uh, membership group, and we run a circular economy special interest group over there. So we're in the sister organisation. So big hello from Oxfordshire. Um, we are specialists at QSA in helping businesses create and adopt circular business models. It's what we do. That's our mission. And basically, it's about making more money by selling less stuff. And this is why that's important. A uh, study from the Alan MacArthur Foundation looking at uh, only a few, for, uh, a few core industries found that around about half of our global climate emissions are due to making stuff. So obviously energy use is a big part, but equally it's our consumption that is also driving climate change. So we need to tackle how much stuff we're consuming. That's why we need to sell less stuff. And just a bit of context in terms of recycling, there is a place for recycling in the circular economy, but it's actually quite a small one. This study from RAP from back in 2009 shows that uh, waste and recycling on a UK scale delivers some climate benefits, some reductions in carbon dioxide, 
Um, but in terms of the consumption reductions that we can achieve, if we take up optimizing the lifetime of our products, as if you heard with things like the electronic products and, and fashion garments, um, moving from goods towards services, providing a service that are selling a thing, or restorative economy, so repairing and upcycling, as we've heard, those things give us 30 to 40 times the climate benefit of recycling the product. So it's about keeping those whole products or modified products in play for as long as possible. Now, I know we're going to go into a chat room, so I'm not going to give you loads and loads of detail on loads of different examples. But basically, all of the examples you see on this slide are people that we have helped to adopt, whether it's a trade-in business model, a service business model. Um, so, for example, on the transport side, Banvolk, they used to buy used tyres, retread them and sell them. We've helped them shift to tyres as a service. And actually, they can now charge their customers more because as a whole package, by making better tyres, they save their customers way more money on fuel than they did originally. So actually, they've, they've moved the value proposition a very long way, and they're providing a service instead of a selling a product now. Um, you know, with Samsung, we help them get into leasing, um, doorstep mobile phone repairs. Crown Workspace does, does furniture fit-out and refurbishment, um, and IT fit-out and refurbishment as well. And with companies like Adidas, we've helped them um, buy clothing back from the market in the UK, but now actually they've moved on to uh, renting sportswear in the French market. So there's loads of different ways that you can take this when you want to. Um, rather than go through these in detail, um, please join me in the breakout room and we can have a chat about them if you want to find out about, about any more of these uh, later on. I have also posted in the chat, we have um, as an output of one of the projects we've done, we've got a free online learning toolkit to help people learn about the sort of steps you need to go through start understanding circular business models and then start to implement them. I've put that link in the chat. Uh, it's gocircular.qsapartners.co.uk. Uh, welcome to go on there and just uh, put your details in. It's free of charge to get into it and have a look and see how to do it for yourself. So I look forward to seeing you in the chat room later. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. I must say that uh, when we started and when we started this event, I felt like every word I was going down and down in my seat, uh, hearing that we needed three planets, that we're consuming less responsibly than five years ago. I was just like, oh, where are we going? And then came the innovators. And now I'm just really uplifted. Thank you all, really, for all your innovations, for your effort to make the planet better and our life better. So conscious of time, what I'm going to do first of all, uh, I have a question I think for Sue and it's about um, the SDG. You know, we've got people in the room, they've made, we've heard about the SDG, but how do you take one and put it on your business? Is it just a case of uplifting the logo and put it? Do you have to report to someone? I think um, what we always say is think about the materiality, you know, which goals need to take them as a set but which goals are relevant to you and which goals do you think you know what elements of it can you really champion uh, I think you can talk about the goals and use the logos um, you know as much as much as you like I think the UN are pleased um, they don't see it as there's no accreditation progress but there are some like B Corp have introduced something where you can uh, you know use the SDGs for your business for example um, so I hope that helps Yes, thank you very much. So yes, if all of us were using uh, this SDG on our website and at least probably you know, committed to it because it's easy to just use a logo and not be committed to it. But if we all choose at least one, that would be an action for today. Um, we've got a few questions specific to uh, some of our speakers, but we can answer to them in the breakout room. However, I'm aware that uh, Peter, you, you won't be able to, to join one of the rooms. If you're still here, there were a few questions in the chat room regarding um, software and how to be you know, consuming responsibly and how to recycle them in a better way. I know there is an issue with software not being uh, lasting long enough. Uh, companies are always creating a new solution and therefore we can't use the old phone for new things. Uh, would you like to add a word on this, please? maybe already already had another meeting yeah he's still <clears throat> i think he's still here 
Or maybe okay. not. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the best way would be if we move to the breakout room. So before we do that, really a big thank you to all our speakers and to all the delegates. Let's take one action today. Oriane, can you move us to the uh, breakout rooms, please? Thank yes. you. Hi, everyone. I'll, um, I'll just open all the rooms now based on what you've selected when you booked the event. Uh, the rooms will open, and then if you could just join them. If you want to change rooms, that's absolutely fine. Just ask me and one of my colleagues, and we'll, we'll move you into the different rooms so you can speak to other speakers. Right. You should have received notification now. 